Ladies and gentlemen, shipmates, what a great start to the night already. It's great to see everyone talking so friendly and openly with each other, which is exactly what we're after. But I'd now like to take this opportunity to talk about why we are actually here tonight. Yes, we're here to recognise the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Coral Sea. But we're also here to recognise the significance of the United States and Australia relationship today and throughout history. That relationship has had many obvious proven successes where we have stood side by side on a battlefield, at sea, ashore, and we've served together protecting each other's country and country men and women in times of need. These times of need have arisen beyond just our close military ties. But this doesn't diminish the significance to our nations. All those in the room who know me well, and even those that I've only recently met, won't be surprised to hear that I'm not known for being the most traditional of officers. I take that as a compliment. Um, I'm definitely part of probably what we call the new generation Navy, where our people and our families and our relationships are a priority. If we get that right, everything else will just follow. Family, relationships. Tonight, I'll take a somewhat untraditional approach to the formalities and use this opportunity to recognise to recognise a modern day hero. A modern day hero of the United States military who paid the ultimate price, not for his country, but for my country. His and his family's sacrifice epitomises why we are here tonight and the importance of our relationship. This will be a very personal story, but I hope you all come with me on this story. It's very, very important. Before we get to that story though, I think it's important to honour the Battle of the Coral Sea, 80th anniversary. Like I said earlier, our country links are very wide and far. And one of the most important links we have is across the many professional training establishments and military colleges, both here and in Australia. I will now call on our most senior student, I don't know if you'll take that as a compliment or not, in America, Commander Ted Seymour. He's about to graduate from the prestigious Naval War College in Rhode, in Rhode Island. And I'm going to get him to talk to us a bit about the history of the Battle of the Coral Sea. Ted, as he walks up now, had the honour of commissioning our third guided missile destroyer, HMA Sydney. Besides the historical significance of being the fifth HMA Sydney, probably the most well-known ship name our Navy has, he was also the first person, first ship to commission at sea since World War II. Back in May 2020, Ted and I talked much at that time as in my previous role. Sir, are we going to commission the ship? Middle of COVID, it, we, we did it at sea. We improvised, we overcame. We commissioned one of our most significant capabilities at sea and Ted did that. I'll now hand over to Ted to talk a little bit about the Coral Sea. Thank you. And also, I would add, I was also going to promote him tonight, but um, he knows this, that's all right, don't look shocked. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, his wife and family couldn't make it tonight. And to me, even though we are a very important crowd to promote him and recognise the fact that he's about to become a captain on return to Australia, to me, it was a bigger priority to do it in front of his family. So, Ted. Thank you, sir. Um, I was actually slightly disappointed when Sydney commissioned about a month before that, a US uh, submarine commissioned underwater. So. <laughs> I thought, I thought, there's a bit of rivalry between the services, right? And I thought that we had done quite well and we were going to do something unique and you beat us to it, so well done. 
Um, the the Commodore was going to uh, is going to talk about um, an American who gave his uh, life serving Australia. There's a lot who have done that uh, for Australia over the years. The Battle of the Coral Sea is in particular one of those events. Um, so I'm at the US Navy War College at the moment. I understand there's a number of people uh, here who are graduates of the US Navy War College, so you will understand that I have a question that the Commodore has given me to answer. That question is, why do we consider the Battle of the Coral Sea to be so significant? And the answer in true Naval War College style is, that depends. <laughs> So it depends on what lens you look at. Uh, by the way, I was told uh, my instructions were I have to be serious, so I only want to be serious. And um, we are not allowed to start any shenanigans until the Americans do first, so when you're ready. Um, the answer depends on the lens through which you look at it. So uh, tactically, operationally, strategically, or in Australia's case, grand strategically. Through a tactical lens, the Battle of the Coral Sea resulted in attrition to both Japanese and the Allies, particularly Japanese aircraft uh, carrier crews. Uh, but it, it, it provided proof that the age of the aircraft carrier had arrived. For the first time, two opposing fleets at sea remained over the horizon at significant distances with ship-launched air power providing offensive fires. This was not another Taranto or Pearl Harbor but a naval battle by deployed forces at sea. Through an operational lens, the Japanese had to delay their planned invasion of Port Moresby. This forced an overland campaign through Kokoda, an extremely difficult ter terrain. The threat to Australia's, Australia's forward operating base at Port Moresby was removed, which allowed Allied counter-offensives in isolation and ultimately the defeat of 350,000 Japanese soldiers in New Guinea, Rabaul and New Britain. Through a strategic lens, the Battle of the Coral Sea must be viewed as a prelude to the Battle of Midway. And the Battle of Midway was obviously the defining moment and the turning point in the Pacific War. Admirals King and Nimitz successfully employed a strategy of hit and run tactics around the Pacific which forced the Japanese to pursue a decisive battle at Midway. And the Battle of the Coral Sea meant that the Japanese entered Midway short three aircraft carriers, one third of their total aircraft carrier strength. While superior repairability on behalf of the USN meant that when US, USS Yorktown was damaged, innovation and effort made sure that Yorktown got back to sea in time for the Battle of Midway uh, and proved to be decisive in that battle. And finally, from Australia's perspective, a grand strategy perspective the Battle of the Coral Sea cemented the Australian-American alliance in the Indo-Pacific. After the disasters of the American, British, Dutch, Australian or ABDA command, and the battles of the Java Sea and the Sunda Strait, the Battle of the Coral Sea forced the integration of Australian ships into US task groups. Rear Admiral Crace's Australian-American task group 17.3 successfully deterred the advance of, Japanese, uh, of the Japanese invasion force at Port Moresby while Admiral Fletcher engaged the Japanese aircraft carriers over the horizon. The threat of invasion to Australia was greatly reduced and it allowed a shift to offensive operations. The blood spilled by both our nations formed the basis for ongoing cooperation ever since. The details of the battle and the ships which participated and the men who led them are all well known to all of you. It's also well documented the advantage that intelligence provided Admiral Nimitz in preparing his forces at the Battle of the Coral Sea and Midway. What's less well known is the, co the cooperation between our two nations to provide elements of that intelligence. Cooperation which continues today at joint facilities such as Pine Gap in Australia and cooperation on an individual level between individuals of each nation. According to renowned historian and author, Captain Stephen Maffio, USN retired, two men at the combined Australian-US radio unit Melbourne, codenamed Belconnen, were key to providing intelligence which changed the course of the battle. Commander Jack Newman, RAN, and Commander Rudolf Fabian, USN, led the team which supplied vital information to Admiral Nimitz's intelligence organisation at fleet radio unit Pacific, codenamed Hypo located with Nimitz at Pearl Harbour. It was Newman, Fabian and their combined team which deciphered the messages detailing the composition 
of the Japanese forces prior to the Battle of the Coral Sea, and in particular, the inclusion of the Japanese aircraft carriers in that order of battle. At one point in the lead up to the battle, Fabian is quoted as entering the, co the code breaking room and saying in a strong American accent, and I'm not gonna try and reproduce that accent because I can't. <laughs> now you guys are sure of what you're writing because they are moving aircraft carriers on the basis of what we are saying today. Perhaps the significance of the Battle of the Coral Sea to Australia and to Australia's alliance with the US is best said by our wartime Prime Minister John Curtin. As the aircraft from USS Lexington and Yorktown attacked the Japanese carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku and HMAS Australia and Hobart fought off repeated air attacks in the Jomard Passage, Curtin told Australia of the battle and its significance. It's rated by many historians as just as, Im just as important as his Australia Turns to America speech, which sent shockwaves through the UK and the US. These are his words in Parliament, 8th of May, 1942. I've received a communique from the Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces of the South West Pacific area stating that a great naval battle is proceeding in the South West Pacific zone. This battle arises from the operations which began on the 4th of May and to which I referred in the House this morning. The events that are taking place today are of crucial importance to the whole of the conduct of the war in this theatre. This battle will not decide the war, it will determine the immediate tactics which will be pursued by the Allied forces and by the common enemy. I ask the people of Australia, having regard to the grave consequences illicit in this engagement, to make a sober and realistic estimate of the duty to the nation. As I speak, those who are participating in the engagement are conforming to the sternest discipline. They are subjecting themselves with all that they have. It may be for many of them the last full measure of their devotion. In the face of such an example, I feel it is not too much to ask of every citizen who today is being defended by these gallant men in that engagement to regard himself as engaged in the second line of service to Australia. The front line needs the maximum support, <coughs> excuse me. The front line needs the maximum support of every man and woman in the Commonwealth. With all the responsibility which I feel, which the government feels, and which I'm sure the parliament as a whole shares, I put it to any man whom my words reach, however they may reach him, that he owes it to these men and to the future of the country not to be stinting in what he will now do for Australia. Men are fighting for Australia today and those who are not fighting have no excuse for not working. Words of Prime Minister Curtin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ted. Um, quite poignant and appropriate words from Prime Minister Curtin. I think he articulated perfectly the significance of the battle and the importance of this to our countries. As I said earlier, without a doubt, it's probably the first time we stood side by side and it set us up for where we are today. There are also many other examples of how we have stood side by side and supported each other since then. One of those times was in January 2020, when Australia was engulfed in the worst wildfires we had experienced in our history. Our country was burning, and for those in Australia, they will remember, especially on the East Coast, that the entire region was covered in smoke and haze and black smoke. Similar to what has been experienced out in California and on the West Coast. Our countries together supported each other. We provided equipment, we provided people to fight on each other's soil against those wildfires. For this story, I need to travel you all back a long way, about 30 years in history. And I'm gonna introduce you to Lieutenant JG Grogan. Gosh, what a guy. Um, I can imagine most of you won't have to think too hard about what Lieutenant JG was right, like um, when he was a professor of navigation at the United States Naval Academy, Annapolis. Professor of navigation, sounds amazing doesn't it? That um, young 20 year old officer on his first shore posting in the Navy got posted to Annapolis to teach navigation. Um, what an amazing experience. I know 
a lot in the room will probably attest and agree that Naval Academies are amazing, as long as you're not one of the midshipmen. Um, <laughs> it's a great place, a great place to be. During that time, besides teaching some very reluctant and respectfully uninterested midshipmen <laughs> about celestial navigation, like seriously people, who doesn't love celestial navigation? <laughs> like, um, I also became the officer representative for the Navy rugby team. Um, during that time, I made some amazing friends, lifelong friends, both students and instructors. One of those students was a young man from San Antonio, Texas, Paul C. Hudson, or as we used to call him, PC. PC always dreamed of flying and was looking forward to a career in the Marine Corps. He studied naval architecture and graduated from the academy in 1999. Anyone who had the pleasure of meeting PC immediately knew what a kind, caring and calm force he could be. He was a joy to be around. A big smile and a big PC hug was always there. He was always the first person to ask you how you were, the first person to ask you how your family was faring. One of those sort of guys. He was an amazing friend. He relished in the simple pleasures of taking time to be with friends. Like many of the mids post academy, I enjoyed following PC's career. Um, like all good military officers, we suck at keeping friends. But over the years, I managed to, pro managed to follow his successes professionally and personally with an odd email here and there and a social media post. In 2001, PC was awarded his NFO wings and selected to fly as a weapons system officer in the F-18 Hornet. After multiple deployments and also graduating from both the Naval Strike Fighter Weapons and Tactics Instructor Course, Top Gun, and the Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Instructor Course, he was ultimately selected for transition training to fly the KC-130. He received his Naval Aviator wins in 2010. PC flew over 3,000 hours in tactical and transport aircraft and flew over 750 combat hours on 200 combat missions. His personal decorations include the Air Medal with 14 Strike Flight Awards, the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal with Gold Star and the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal with Gold Star and Combat V. PC retired from the Marine Corps in September 2019 to take up a role with Colson Aviation where he flew the C-130 aerial water tanker. As the Director General of Operations for the Navy in January 2020, in my last role, I was very excited to reconnect with PC when he flew to Australia to help my country fight against the devastating wildfires referred to earlier. In speaking with PC, he was his normal, cool, calm, collected self like he was back in the academy. He was just happy to assist a friend in need. On Thursday, on Thursday, 24th of January, 2020, PC and two other US military veterans turned civilian firefighters paid the ultimate sacrifice in protecting Australia. Tonight, on behalf of a grateful nation and a proud nation, I want to formally honour PC for his service and recognise his wife, Noreen, who stood by PC through his distinguished career. There isn't much I can say that will ease the pain, but what I can say is all of us in uniform, we cannot do what we do without the love and support of those people at home. Please, I'd like to Welcome, Noreen, to say a few words. And uh, sorry, I'm probably not helping here. Um, <laughs> On January 23rd, 2020, my life hit a brick wall going the speed of sound. Six days later, I was asked to describe my husband in a few words for a memorial in Australia. I cannot imagine a more monumentous task. How does one describe the man that was the light of my life, the center of my universe? 
Throughout times, there have been discussions regarding the rotation of the solar system. Is the Earth the center of the universe, or is it the sun? For me, the answer was neither. My universe was Paul. What would happen if our solar system lost the sun? Unfortunately, I now know that answer and the darkness and the coldness that ensues. My thoughts of Paul these last several months have been a mixture of honoring the man that was, remembering the person I love, and gripping the endless abyss in my soul over an incomprehensible measure of time. Throughout life, we have learned to measure time in all that we do. But I have come to realize that when intertwined with overwhelming grief, there is no measure of time. Time flies by, yet inches at an agonizing pace. In Paul's 42 years of life, he served in many roles, son, brother, marine, pilot, and husband. But my husband really was none of those at heart. Truly at the core, my husband was an ally. He was an ally to those he loved. He was an ally to those he led. He was an ally who, to anyone who came along and wanted to know Paul Hudson. He turned no one away and without even meaning to was truly a class act. He was an example of what all of us aspire to be. He woke every day with a, a smile and an infectious enthusiasm for what lie ahead. Every task executed and every person encountered, he approached with integrity, honesty, and generosity. He possessed a rare and complete joy for life. I have never seen in another human being, nor do I ever expect to again. He embraced every moment, with which yes meant he wasn't always going to be on time. And for those who knew Paul Hudson, time was an ish. <laughs> Many who knew him called this Hudson time and gave him much grief about this. But to Paul, it was an unapologetic duty of being present and giving his full attention to the matter or person at hand. Paul ensured that when he showed up, he showed up. No reservations, no excuses, what were you were getting was his absolute best. When in the presence of someone like this, it is impossible to not realize how important we were to him. That drew us in, that drew me in. It made us all want to be part of his moment. But Paul lived for our presence. Throughout his 20 years as a Marine, Paul again served in many roles, Wizzo, FAC, Aviator, and was reiterated to me on numerous occasions, every Marine is a rifleman first. <laughs> but again, these roles didn't define my husband. They were merely mechanisms for his true calling and love, which was supporting others. The fun of the role was just a bonus for him. This led him to continue flying and supporting others after his Marine Corps career. Paul loved aerial firefighting. After a day of flying, he would call, and with the excitement of a child on Christmas Day, tell me, I'm a firefighter, baby. And I would remind him, you sit in an air-conditioned cockpit. <laughs> and he would respond, no, I'm a firefighter, baby. Whether leading the Marines, supporting firefighters on the ground, or helping others in harm's way, Paul had a calling to protect and to serve. To Paul, they all needed him. Many would call this egotistical, but for Paul, it was a lifelong passion for allying himself with others to lift them up to his best. Therefore, at heart, he was an ally, a true living hero. For him, living this enablement served the greater purpose of protecting another's future. And at his core, of seven billion people on this planet, at Paul's core, he was the least important. Paul's greatest role in his achievement 
was his 12 years as my husband. His virtues of honesty, generosity, and as my ultimate ally in life became the foundation for our fairy tale marriage. We had an amazing marriage built on adoration and respect. Every day I felt his love. We were so crazy head over heels for each other. I was never fully a whole person before Paul, and as I stand before you today, my greatest fear is I will never fully be a whole person again. Many who knew us told us on several occasions that he worships you, and he loves you so much, Noreen. But everyone who said that had it backwards. I worshiped him. He was my blessing in life. For 12 years, all that mattered to us was each other and spending time together. There are no words strong or poetic enough to define what we had. It was a precious, precious blessing. Six days after I buried Paul at Arlington National Cemetery, Cemetery, it would have been our 13th wedding anniversary. On October 22nd, 2007, Paul promised me a lifetime of happiness, a promise he fulfilled every day thereafter. My mistake was in assuming this would be my lifetime. I now realize that promise was for his. Our time together was far too short. But thanks to Paul, I've had the privilege of being intimately understood, absolutely supported, and now eternally loved. It was an honor and a privilege not to only be Paul's wife, but more importantly, his best friend and truly other half. Our time together was far too short, and now time has become infused with grief. Every moment contains both love and pain. We cannot go back in time and make him live again. Time will not bring relief, nor will it heal all wounds as I've come to realize. And those who knew Paul are all wounded. But we are all alive. And Paul loved life. All that is left for us to do now is emulate his virtues, ensuring that his past is not forgotten, his presence in our memory is cherished, and the future fills his energy and spirit. Thank you all for honoring my husband tonight and not forgetting. Thank you, thank you, Noreen, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being part of this tonight. I, I genuinely, and I know Noreen and PC. We're not trying to. I don't want to bring an amazing night down. This is a celebration, just like we're celebrating 80 years of the Battle of the Coral Sea. We're recognising those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, it's sad. Yes, it's moving. Yes, it's beautiful. And I really thank you for being part of this tonight. But it's not going to make us sad. We're... Noreen doesn't want to be sad. I don't want to be sad. PC doesn't want to be sad. We're going to drink. We're going to have fun. And we're going to celebrate the amazing relationship we have as countries together, Australia and America. I think it's an amazing opportunity tonight for all of us to sit around the table, to break bread, to drink wine, and to rekindle our friendships. This is hopefully the first step of many more coming out of COVID. This is a perfect example of why all of us are here. Commodore, why in the world would you have me come up after all of that? <laughs> Incredible. That's right. It is a celebration. It is. It's a celebration night. How about a big hand for Commodore Grogan in Australia for hosting an incredible event tonight?
So yes, uh, so uh, uh, Ad Admiral Schultz, sailors, soldiers, airmen, coasties, marines from all nations, friends, family, allies, what a great evening uh, tonight. So you know, Admiral Gilday was supposed to be here and uh, was not able to make it. So I, 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 there's, you know, there's some logic by which he asked somebody to fill in for him. I think in this case it was uh, Trussler. I, I never know what he's talking about, but he's loud and enthusiastic. It will use him. It will fit. So here I am. But I, I wasn't sure. Darren, Darren was hard to get a hold of for a while because uh, our team took the attaches out on the Ford uh, a, a week or so ago, and they toured a submarine. They did all. They went around the world, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, for Anzac Day, which there was an incredible uh, uh, sunrise service downtown uh, last week. Uh, no, Darren's not here. He, he's in San Diego. He, for some reason, he needs to be in San Diego uh, for that. So I, I was kind of trying to track him down. and. Hey, well, what is the Coral Sea celebration? I understand you haven't had one in a while. What do you want me to do? And, and he sent back a nice note. Oh, oh, it'll be fine. I've allotted you just a couple of minutes. And if you just say, uh, uh, thanks for having us, uh, Aussies rock, that'll be great. <laughs> so anyway, I will pretty much do that. But you gave me the mic. Hey, Russ, where are you? Could you, could you bring me that gavel? Could you bring, just, just, just bring it up here. I don't know if I outed him or uh, what here. I just need, I just, I, I meant to take it myself. I, and I, I, I kind of probably missed some rules of product. I was more interested, not so much in uh, how the dining in, dining out rules, all that's a little different tonight. But as I, as I was sitting next to the Commodore, and having dinner, and there, there was a kerfuffle. He had, he had some plans, and he had some contingency plans about getting a gavel. But sitting through most of dinner, this little bitty tiny gavel is sitting there. <laughs> now, what in the world are you going to do with this tiny gavel? What is this tiny gavel supposed to mean and represent? I, I don't get it, but uh, Colorado I somehow ended up with this thing. <laughs> hey, uh, so, hey, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to just say a few words tonight. Uh, for some reason, uh, maybe it was destiny. I mean, from uh, very early on, I continue to rub up against the Australians in various ways or form. And one of the first, I got married to my lovely bride here in this uniform 30 years ago. And we hopped on uh, a standby uh, space available flight and we went to Australia. And that was our first experience. Never, we didn't even have a plan. We ended up in Alice Springs and uh, bounced around <laughs> and then on board a submarine of yours for 11 days. <laughs> that's, that's about how things have gone for us. But I had the privilege uh, last month uh, in March of spending a week down in Australia. And I had the opportunity uh, for, for some meetings. And I had the opportunity on the first day to visit uh, the war memorial and uh, to lay a wreath uh, for the, I got to be the first one uh, in two years to lay a wreath at the last post uh, event. Extraordinarily moving. And if, uh, if you make it to Australia, you must go to the war memorial. And an extraordinary, I got an extraordinary appreciation that day uh, for our shared history, our shared battles, why we are allies and how we have been allies. It, it started really back in World War I and an extraordinary representation there of, of a battle way over in Europe, but halfway around the world, uh, the Aussies and the Kiwis mustered up, you know, and uh, sailed off uh, to Gallipoli. And they, they uh, in an extraordinary manner, honor the, uh, that battle, those sacrifices, and many other things. But when the presentation, and, and, and thank goodness, you know, because I was already studying the Battle of Coral Sea and was going to, oh boy, do I have to talk about that? And thank goodness we have some real history here talking about that. I'm, the Animal House folks, they, they, that line came from me, the Germans bombing somebody, right? But he said it right. It's the lens on which you, you look through it. And from the United States, sometimes we just have this lens of Pearl Harbor happened. And then, uh, then we punched them with the Doolittle raid, and uh, something happened in the Coral Sea, and then we rocked it midway and <laughs> took them out, right? I mean, that's kind of this lens by which we look at it. And, uh, and, and 
just it's just it's just where you're sitting and how you look at things and we forget about you know February 19th you know uh, you know the Japanese had pushed out all over the Pacific and they bombed Darwin there was a real threat and a fear that maybe they're gonna push down to Australia and that intelligence that he talked about you know okay we made the decision uh, move the, uh, the uh, Lexington to Yorktown down to the Coral Sea. I always wondered what the heck were they doing way down there, you know, before that Battle of Midway. And, uh, you know, we talk about that, that battle that were the first battle in history where ships never sighted each other. And that's kind of the theme. What, what we forget to talk about was uh, the Australian commander of Task Force 44, Rear Admiral Crace, and uh, the, the Australian ship, uh, uh, Australia and, uh, and uh, Sydney, I'm gonna make sure I got that right. The Australia and the Hobart and the US ship Chicago were detached by Admiral Fletcher to go towards Port Mor Moresby. And they're what actually stopped. There was a, you know, a great battle, an interesting battle. Uh, it was commented that the Japanese bombed Admiral Crace's uh, task force. Ah, they didn't do they didn't do very well a little damage uh, but the Americans bombed them too being confused and they were horrible so the good news is uh, they went on and it was really Admiral Crace's actions that saved and prevented the Japanese from taking Port Moresby which was the stepping stone uh, to Australia and so we forget that sometimes but when you look at that lens of history now you know Pearl Harbor Darwin the Doolittle Raid of Punch the Coral Sea Australia is now uh, relatively safe. Remember, we had uh, uh, debarked a lot of troops now down to Australia, and MacArthur had fled the Philippines and, and many other forces we don't often talk about down to Australia. And from there, from that southern part, and uh, after Midway, that's, you know, the Japanese were stopped. It wasn't easy. It took us three years to push all the way back before, and, and before we ended the war. But it started between Pearl Harbor, and Australia, and that battle inside the Coral Sea. So I, I appreciate the fact that we're going to have a bunch of big midway celebrations as we do every June 6th in the year. But the fact that the Australians recognize the Battle of the Coral Sea as an extraordinary and significant event that turned the tide of World War II back in 1942. Think about that seven months. Think about that seven months in the lives of our nations a little confusing. We didn't really know how to do battle yet, but allies banded together, stopped that flow, and then steadily pushed back for the next three years to bring it into that war. And uh, 80 years later, allies still strong, uh, still working together. So let's get on with the celebration tonight, and we'll figure out what this tiny little uh, <laughs> thing was for. Thank you. I just need to find the other half. <laughs> So, uh, Noreen, thank you very much for your incredibly kind words uh, this evening. Uh, what I would ask now is that we uh, move into dessert uh, and then we'll have a, uh, a short break before we uh, transition into port and uh, the opportunities for uh, toasts. So, uh, with your permission, I'd like to move to dessert, please. Please, thank you. Thank you, sir.